Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, is taxation theft or is it slavery? We published an article written by Patrick Carroll titled Taxation is Slavery, a Biblical Case, and it is fantastic. If you've been following our project, then you'll be familiar with Patrick from episode 16, where we discuss his article, If You Vote, You Can't Complain. Patrick has a way of getting folks to think, and that is our goal with this project. I'm excited to have Patrick back on the show to discuss this topic about taxation, because I don't believe calling taxation theft describes what is actually happening. Patrick, how are you doing, my friend? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Like I mentioned in the intro, your your article that we talked about on episode 16 was something that I had already been thinking about. If you vote, you can't complain. And you dropped that article on our Facebook page. And I'm like, I got to get this guy on the show. I want to talk about this because this has been, that was mulling through my head. It was leading up to the election and stuff. And you nailed it with that one. It got a lot of great feedback with this. But this this article, is taxation theft or is it slavery? I mean, there it is. Is it slavery? But before we get into it. What have you been up to since episode 16? Yeah, so that was released, I think, uh, last October. So um, since then, I've started working for FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, I was part-time at first, and then I went full-time in April. And that's been a really exciting opportunity. Uh, I write articles for them. I do editing. I vet our external submissions. Uh, I'm also working with a project we have called the Hazlitt Project, which is a writing apprenticeship program where we're training young writers, teaching them about the ideas of liberty, trying to make them be really good influencers out in the world. So yeah, I'm really excited about uh, what we're up to. And it's been a lot of fun, both learning about economics and political philosophy, and then being able to teach that through my writing and through the sessions we have. I think that you mentioned that to me when we we recorded the first time about you getting started with fee. Absolutely. And you, you're really excited about it. And now you, you're full on with that now. That's awesome, man. And you have a lot of great things to say. Like I said, you get away, you have a way of getting folks to think. That's what we need people to do is think. Just let's, let's think about the situation we're in. And that's what I love about this article so much. Is taxation slavery? Is it theft? Like libertarians always say taxation is theft. Okay, <laughs> we can say that. But is it slavery? And I've been having conversations with folks online about trying to get folks, get them to understand that this situation that we're in, under the system that we are, you're in Canada, I'm in the United States. Now, talking to you before we started recording, it sounds like y'all are in a lot more draconian things, but I think the United States is heading that way. And when I mentioned to folks, like, listen, do you understand that we are slaves to this system? It makes them think, it makes them, but then you get, you know, they'll scoff at you too. We're not slaves. And my, my, my retort is, all right, so does, Slavery prevents you from being free. Does the state prevent you from being free? Think about that for a second. Does, is that not the same thing? Maybe I'm overthinking. What do you think? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. Slavery is when a person is owned by someone else, right? Like that's, that's literally the definition. And, and what is ownership? Ownership is control of something. If I own my water bottle, it means I get to decide where it goes, who uses it. If I own my car, I, I get to decide who takes it somewhere, right? The state has the right, the ultimate right to decide how we live our lives, what drugs we put in our body, even with things like conscription, right? So I think if, if you just think about it um, from a definitional perspective, it's like, how is it not slavery? It can't, it, there's no other explanation. But when you, when people think about slavery, they think about like in back in the 1800s, the Civil War, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Were they really freed? Mm -hmm. were, were, the, were the slaves really freed? Yeah, it's a great question. And certainly that was a much more brutal form of slavery. Like we don't have that kind of chattel slavery here. Um, and yet we, we in many ways have a, a much more insidious form where 
uh, you know, our, our life savings are taxed away from us. There's inflation. And there's all sorts of regulations. There's the military industrial complex. There's the, the prison complex and the war on drugs. There's a lot of ways where it's maybe not as visible or not as abhorrent as it was in the past, but it's still very much there. Well, the state has a very good way of uh, hiding their uh, slave master role. They do. They 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 can go about it around the way to make it look like you're 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 free. I had somebody tell me one time. It's like you you get your rights from the government. I was like, dude, that's slavery. Mm -hmm. No other person gives me my rights. We were born. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. And we're talking to Christians with this with this podcast more often than not. Our rights come from God. We are created with those rights. Now, if you have it and, and you bring this up in this freaking fantastic article, and we're going to I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to get into this. Let's get into your article real quick, because this is this is fantastic. So let's just start at the beginning. And you start with 1 Samuel 8. That's a go-to, right, for Christian anarchists, you know, how God tells us how governments are going to behave. And you said, unfortunately to them, these efforts have often been in vain. People want to create a human government, but it's in vain. What are they doing? Yeah, so 1 Samuel 8 is kind of the... Uh one of the first instances where the, the people of Israel come to Samuel and they're like, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. And it's important to, to step back and think about the context. This was antithetical to the whole way that Israel was supposed to be set up. Israel was supposed to be uh, a holy people. Holy means set apart, different, other than the rest of the nations, right? And so for them to say, we want to be like the other nations, that should immediately be a red flag. The other nations are the ones that have kings. Um, but as Samuel says, God is supposed to be our king. And, and, and so what God does is, is he says, okay, go to Samuel. I'm, I'm going to grant them this request. But first, you're going to warn them about what it's going to be like. And he, he goes through like, he's going to take a tenth of your fields. He's going to take your sons and daughters. And, and he explains what the king will do. And then at the end of the set, at the end of the, uh, the passage, he says, he will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. God says right there in 1 Samuel, like, if you're going to have a king, He's going to be your master. You're, you're going to be his subjects. That's that's just the way that kingship works. And uh, unfortunately, the, the people didn't heed those warnings. Um, but it's it's something that I think we should heed. And, and as we get into this discussion, uh, we'll see exactly uh, more about what that paradigm of kingship meant for Israel and, and what it meant in terms of God's perspective. I love what you said here. It says, Christians who advocate for human rulers today tend to assume that God is only opposed to unjust rulers. Mm -hmm. But notably, the possibility of injustice is not the reason God gives for rejecting the Israelites' request. Rather, God warns them about actions that are common to all kings, such as taxation. Most strikingly, God says they will become the king's slaves. And you just mentioned that. God is not saying they might become his slaves if he is unjust. God is saying that slavery is inherent whenever there is a king to be ruled and taxed is to be a slave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of Christians, um, when they when they first hear this argument, they push back and they say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Romans thirteen, like God institutes governments, and so and and they also point to in Deuteronomy, there's a list of rules for the king. So how would it make sense for God to create a list of rules for the king if he didn't want a king in the first place? Uh, and and so the way a lot of Christians interpret this is they say what God's really saying here is that he's against unjust rulership. And, and of course, they would point to like communist China and say, obviously, that's wrong because it's authoritarian. But that doesn't mean all government's wrong. It only means unjust rulers are wrong, that only authoritarian rulers are wrong. And God is perhaps warning them that um, the, the king is going to become an authoritarian, and, and that's why it's a bad idea. But if you, if you read the text, God doesn't say, well, you know, kingship is a good idea as long as it's limited and as long as, um, you know, it doesn't become unjust, right? Like, like God doesn't cite the, the possibility for injustice as the reason to not have a king. He says, no, he's going to tax you as if that's inherently wrong. He's going he's gonna to conscript your sons and daughters as if that's inherently wrong. Um, and, and so I think the argument that God is only imposed to unjust kings doesn't come from this text. It's, it's read into this text based on what I would consider misinterpretations of passages like Romans 13, which we can get into later. Uh, if you'd like. But I, I think reading this text 
kind of at its face value and really trying to put yourself in the paradigm of the Israelites, uh, it doesn't make sense that there's this whole just government versus unjust government. From God's perspective, it's all unjust. Yes. And I think that is what is mis it, you just said it, misinterpreted by most Christians. We just because there's a government and now all right, let, let's let's step back for a second. Mm-hmm. Do you know a government? Have you known a human made government that has had everybody's best interest in mind? Doesn't exist. I can't think of one either. You know, and you're in Canada, but I do know talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ here in the United States who are still stuck in that idea that the United States government is good and God created this government. I used to be that guy. Now, if you look at what the United States government is doing across this globe that God created, are you going to honestly tell me that they are being just? They are, they are following God's law. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. And I think anyone who's honest about it is like, yeah, the United States government is um, committing a lot of atrocities. Um, again, from the foreign, foreign intervention to the war on drugs. It's brutal. So you said to understand this, we need to keep in mind that kings in those days used taxes primarily to enrich themselves and the nobility rather than as a means of redistributing wealth. And that's another thing people talk about. Well, if we tax those, if we tax the rich, if we tax the folks. We can help mm-hmm. those that are in need. Mm-hmm. That's not what they're doing, and this is what this is what many many Christians that defend what's going on with government use this. All right, so we're going to help the needy. No, no, no. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't go to to Caesar and say, "Here's my money. Do with it to help those." No, Jesus said, "You go do it. You, Patrick. You, Craig. You go. You go help those in need." Yeah, and, and real charity isn't coerced, right? If if you're taking someone's money from them at gunpoint, like that that's not being a good person. That's just being coerced, right? And and yeah, it's it's funny to say, but like Jesus never said we should go to Caesar and give our money to Caesar. And you could say, well, that's because Caesar was authoritarian. But you look throughout the entire purview of scripture, there is no concept of using government as a means of promoting the general welfare. God never says, go give your money to a king so that he can redistribute it to the poor. He says, give charitably out of your own voluntary, you know, goodwill. And like, that is just the the pattern throughout the Bible. And so I think it's a mistake for Christians to say, oh, well, we should advocate for raising taxes on the rich, which by the way, is the sin of envy, pretty much is saying that, oh, well, they have more of us, therefore we should take from them. It's like, literally in the 10 commandments, don't steal. And then very shortly thereafter, don't don't even envy, don't covet, uh, right? Like, don't want what, what your neighbor has. That is the entire philosophy that motivates this tax, the rich ideology. Now, do the rich have a duty to give to the poor, to give generously because they have been given much? Absolutely. But the way to do that is, is to persuade them, is to exhort them using scripture and, and uh, appealing to, to the morality, uh, not by coercing them. You, you, see, you see how the rich can get around the loopholes of taxes. I applaud them. You know, fine, do it. If you can get around it, do it. Now, if you're going to, like you just said, if you're going to use that money to help those, do it. Hmm. If you're going to do it to help yourself. And and Christians have a way, and this is this is something that, that is so maddening to me with, with Christians, but especially when they go vote and they go put these folks in power. They are outsourcing their own sin to the government mm-hmm. to take care of those folks that we don't like or to kill those folks that we don't like. It's not it's not blood on our hands. They did it. No, hang on a second. You put those folks in power. You did this. So you cannot outsource your sin to these power hungry mongrels mm-hmm. that do nothing but still kill and, and rape people. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. How Christian are you if you're going to outsource this to these folks? You cannot change the state through the state. You change people's hearts and minds through the teachings of Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's it. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. 
Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. And send us an email at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project and we would love for you to join us and help him promote it. Now back to the show. All right, so in this next section of your article, it says some examples from the Bible will help to illustrate this paradigm regarding slavery and government. To begin, foreign nations would often become slaves when they were conquered. And this was demonstrated by the fact that they would send tribute to the conquering king. Being forced to send tribute was an act of enslavement because they were no longer working for themselves. Even within the nation of Israel, it was understood that taxpayers were under a form of slavery. In the story of David and Goliath, the men of Israel speak of the rewards that will be given to the one who slays Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, 25, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give his, him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. I want you to follow up with this because I love how you describe this in this article. Mm-hmm. So this this one was really fascinating uh, when I started looking into like what does the Bible te- teach about taxation and slavery and and where do these kind of words appear? There's a great website that I use called Blue Letter Bible and it's really handy for doing word studies and um, finding different things. So, anyways, I, I came across this verse and what's interesting about this verse is that there's a few different ways to translate it. So, uh, kind of the more literal way to translate it is. Um, And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. However, some translations, they they move away from the Hebrew a bit, but they they kind of get the point across. Uh, They say he will make his father's house exempt from taxes Uh, because that's really what this is getting at. And and there are a lot of commentaries that kind of support this idea that that's what that's what it means to make the father's house, quote unquote, free. Now, as as I talk about in the article, the Hebrew word for free there is choshi. But that word very frequently throughout the Old Testament is used in contrast to slavery, whether we're talking about uh, like the slavery in Egypt uh, or or slavery to other governments. uh, This idea of being set free is often like a slave who's set free. And yet the exact same Hebrew word is used here clearly within the context of being exempt from taxes. So then the question is, okay, if being set free from slavery is equivalent to not having to pay taxes, then the implication is that having to pay taxes is being a slave. And if we were paying attention in 1 Samuel 8, this shouldn't come as a surprise. This is just the standard biblical paradigm. And this is another example of, of where that paradigm is just assumed because it's so obvious. Of course, you're a slave if you have to pay taxes. And you said this paradigm is further revealed in 1 Kings 12, where we read about the tax revolt that divided the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Mm-hmm. After the death of King Solomon, Oh, I can't say this guy. His name Re- Rehoboam. 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 His son was made king, and he was immediately presented with a request from the people: "Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you." The image of yoke is common biblical picture of slavery, and it's it's actually talked about in the New Testament too. And I can't wait till we get to the New Testament part of this because this that's my favorite part of all this. But but it's also used to refer tribute to exacted by kings. In in this case, it was completely natural for the people to talk about high taxes as a heavy yoke because the idea of taxes being a burden was common knowledge. In light of this observation, we should carefully consider the implications of these words from Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I chose choose? to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Isaiah 58, 6. Yeah, so one of the things I found interesting in studying 1 Kings 12, yeah, so we talk about how, you know, there was Saul, David, and Solomon were like the three kings when the kingdom was united, and then the kingdom divided. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize until I studied this more closely, the reason for the division was essentially a tax revolt. It was essentially Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, um, came to the people after Solomon died. uh, And the people were like, yo, our taxes are really heavy. Could you lighten the load? Of course, it's biblical language. Our yoke is very heavy, right? And and then the story goes, he consults with the elders. And the elders are like, look, if you ease off on the taxes now, the people will love you forever and they'll serve you. And so, so you should probably grant their request. 
And then he goes and he talks to his younger friends and his younger friends are like, ah, just, you know, just, just keep taxing them heavily and, and even tax them more heavily, you know? Uh, and, and so he thinks about it and he comes back and he decides to listen to his younger friends and tax them even more heavily. He says, I'm going to make your yoke even stronger, even, even heavier. And as a result of that, um, the, most of the Israelites are like, okay, well, we're not going to follow you anymore. And, and, and the kingdom is divided as a result of that. But I, I find it interesting that this picture of a yoke, because again, throughout the Old Testament, um, the idea of a yoke is commonly used uh, as a picture for slavery. And in Isaiah 58, it's interesting that Isaiah talks about this is the fast that I choose to, to undo the straps of the, the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. Now, from our modern perspective, it's very easy to say, oh, God's against slavery. But remember, the picture of a yoke in 1 Kings 12 is used to refer to taxes. And so if Isaiah really means every yoke, now I'm, I'm not saying this is like a open and closed absolute proof of, you know, taxation being slavery here, but it's something worth thinking about. If Isaiah really means every yoke should be taken off of the people, well, doesn't, doesn't that include the yoke of taxation? Isn't that an indictment of kings subjugating their people by taking a fraction of their wealth? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, what, what, I was ta- what I was telling you earlier, in discussion with folks online about what we're witnessing today, all right, so... It's easy to say, all right, yes, the government's oppressive. The government is doing things that they shouldn't be doing. But what I want people to finally start understanding is that we've become, we are slaves, not become, we are slaves to a government system that is unjust. I don't care if it's a just government. They don't have the right to tell me how to live regardless. I don't care if they have my best interest in mind. If I want to live as a slave, let me do that. But if I don't, leave me alone. And and when when we use use terminology like slavery, it always goes back to, well, what happened in the Civil War? What was happening to black people in early America, you know, or white people in Ireland? You know, it's, it's slavery has been predominant throughout history, but now we are so accepting of it. Like we just, all right, we'll just be slaves and we're not going to call ourselves. We're free. No, you're not. Let's, we need to think about this for a second. If you are having to ask permission and you mentioned this in our first episode, I listened to it last night. You, it is something you brought up that Larkin Rose says, if you are going to ask somebody permission, you're already a slave. Asking permission to be free Asking permission not to be taxed. People tell me, well, I'm going to go vote for less taxes. You're asking, <laughs> you're asking not to be a slave. No, ignore them. Walk away. This is what I want Christians to try and finally do. Folks that are not Christians are, are going to do whatever. But Christians need to understand that we have one king, and his kingdom is not of this world. We need to walk away from these systems that humans have put up. God did not set up these governments. Human beings set up these governments. And God told us in 1 Samuel what's going to happen. What's going to happen? And it's happening every day. It's been happening ever since. And we keep going and going and going and along like it's going to get better if we get the right person in office. Are they going to stop? Are they going to tax us less? Maybe. But what's going to happen when the next guy comes around that, that you don't agree with? He's going to tax you more. What are you doing? It, it's like beating your head against a brick wall, trying to make things better. It's like uh, Albert Einstein said, he goes, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Come on. We're not all, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the smartest person in the world by any means, but I do know that. I do know that I can recognize what's happening here and it's not working. Let's walk away. Let's walk away from slavery. Let's walk away from it and follow Jesus Christ because that guy has our best interest in mind. All right. I apologize. I went on a rant. <laughs> no worries. I, I think the takeaway for Christians especially is to understand that to the extent that we participate in government, we are complicit in enslaving our neighbors. Yes. Right? Yes. By, by voting, by uh, even by... In, this is going to be a hot take by being police officers or soldiers, right? By, by being the enforcement arm of the state, we are, are complicit in 
uh, subjugating our neighbors in a way that I don't think Christ would approve of. Right. And well, <laughs> I was talking to somebody earlier and in, in the United States, every police officer, every soldier takes an oath of the United States Constitution. In this, it says, we will defend freedoms against enemies, foreign and domestic. Domestic. Now, that doesn't mean domestic terrorists like they call these folks that rushed the Capitol on, in January, which was obviously co-opted by the feds. I mean, I mean that, that was so plain to see. Anyway, let's not go down that rabbit hole. But if we were actually being defended, our freedoms were actually being defended by these police officers and these soldiers, then every governor's mansion, the White House would be on fire right now. Those are domestic terrorists. Those are domestic enemies. Those folks that y'all have put in office and you think you're going to change it. I'm going way off course with this. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's so funny. Just one final comment on this. Um, the definition of terrorism is violence and intimidation um, that is used normally against civilians for political ends. Uh, however, they had to insert in that definition unlawful violence and intimidation, especially <laughs> against civilians, lens. because as, as some have pointed out, what is law enforcement? It is just the lawful version of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political ends, namely the enforcement of law. It, it's quite shocking, but yeah, it, I don't want to live in a society of violence and intimidation. And therefore I want to live in a voluntary society where it, yes, we need security, but I, I don't think that the state is, is the way to achieve that. What, what law are they enforcing? The state's laws. The state's laws. And, and I, I had somebody ask me, I actually get this question quite a bit when I talk about uh, a voluntary society. I was like, well, what about the police officers? What about security? Yeah, we we'll still have it. But guess what? They won't be beholden to some politicians. They'll be beholden to you. And guess what? If, they don't, if, they don't, if they're not doing how you want them to act, you're gone, Jack. We'll find somebody else to do it. If it wasn't for the police and the military, then politicians would be nothing but people with bad ideas. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just like any other private service. You, you'd have market competition for security. Um, private security guards already outnumber public police officers in America. Right, right? So it's, it's not like this isn't possible. This is already happening. Uh, I wrote an article back when the George Floyd protests happened called Police Accountability Requires Consumer Choice. Uh, and it's basically laying out this idea that the, the only way to actually achieve accountability and, and to have a good kind of protection service is, is if there's consumer choice, if, if there's essentially a free market in security. So I, I'm not denigrating the role, but I'm saying there's a, there's a better way to frame the incentives that, that would make it actually a, a righteous role. Hey folks, Craig here again. As you know, this project is completely self-funded by me and all profits go straight to charities here in Memphis. If you have a blog, a podcast, or a product that you would like to advertise on the Bad Roman Podcast, the first 15 folks to sign up for four ad spots with us will get a fifth spot for free. Visit thebadroman.com slash ads. I'm so happy how this project has grown and thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the conversation. We, we went off a little bit and that's cool because we do it all the time and we always kind of come back to where we started. So now we're going to get into the New Testament. This is awesome for me because as we go with this, this project, we're very Jesus centric. We try to follow what Jesus said, you know, the words of Jesus Christ. All right. The New Testament also discusses the issue of taxation in the context of slavery. For example, consider the words of Jesus in Matthew 17. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax, I don't even know if I said that right, went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said, the sons are free. That's pretty powerful, dude. And and honestly, I had never read that in that context until I read your article. So a lot of people, when they think about Jesus and taxes, they immediately go to render into Caesar what is Caesar's, render into God what is God's. And that's a great verse, and, and there's lots of good discussion to be had there. But I am particularly fascinated by this verse. Um, so so there's this temple tax um, that people are, are supposed to pay. 
And Jesus is kind of making the point that, like, we are sons of Israel. We're, we're sons of God, in, in a sense, because they were the people of God. They, they shouldn't actually have to pay the tax because the whole point is that taxes are normally levied on, uh, on others, on, on people who aren't the sons. Uh, but the way that Jesus makes the point, uh, he says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toller tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Now, the Greek word for free there is eleutheros. Eleutheros, the, the most literal translation, is not a slave. So, for example, in Galatians 3.28, where Paul says, neither slave nor free, male nor female. Slave nor free, the, the word for free is, is eleutheros, right? It, it means a free man, someone who is not enslaved, right? And so when Jesus uses this word in this context, he's saying the sons are free. That is, the sons are not slaves. But what he means in this context is the sons don't have to pay taxes. Okay, well, if the sons aren't slaves because they don't have to pay taxes, then again, the implication is the people who do have to pay taxes are slaves, right? And so right here, you have Jesus. Again, he doesn't come out and say it explicitly, but the paradigm he's operating under is incredibly obvious. Of course, if you have to pay the tax, then you're a slave and the sons are free. That is not slaves. Makes sense. I always love how when reading uh, the words of Jesus and, and how he left people with so many questions, like, you know, when they, they would ask him questions, then he would ask them a question and then they couldn't respond. And then, you know, that they were walking away thinking, dang, <laughs> and then he got their wheels turning in their head. And I always loved of that. I love reading that when I'm, when I'm reading his, the words of Jesus, because he just, you can't, you can't argue with a guy, you know what I'm saying? Like you can you can, you can try to come at him. The Pharisees came at him with all kinds of questions and he would in turn ask them a question and they couldn't answer. And that's what I love so much about him. That's what I try. I'm not Jesus, obviously, but that's what I try to do with folks. It's like, all right, ask me a question. Now let me ask you a question. And if you can't answer it, let's go on. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're going to get back, oh, back to the Old Testament. Nehemiah also commented on the oppressive taxation of Israel under the rule of foreign kings. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is at the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. Yeah, so uh, in Nehemiah, there is some discussion about how um, the, the tax is really heavy, and so they even had to borrow money. Uh, and then in Nehemiah 5, it talks about how they were charging interest on that borrowed money in the usury, and, and it was becoming a really heavy burden for people. Uh, and then a little bit later in, later in Nehemiah 5, Nehemiah himself comments on the oppressive levels of taxation. He says, the former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people, even their ser servants loaded over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. Nehemiah sees it as improper to tax people heavily um, out of the fear of God. Um, and, and then he goes on in verse 18, yet for all of this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. And, and so there's a recognition there that like, taxing people too heavily is uh, is problematic. Now, of course, then the question is, well, what count, what constitutes too heavily? Um, let's put it this way. Tax levels in our current day and age are in many cases a lot higher than they were in ancient times, uh, right? You, you think about the, the American Revolution. It's much higher than then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Like the Americans re revolted over what today would be considered a very small level of taxation, right? So there, there's there's no hard and fast rule, but I mean, the, the whole point is that like any taxation is is still ultimately a, a form of subjugation and, and taking from people what is rightfully theirs. And then the, the connection is made a lot more explicitly in Nehemiah 9. Um, so in Nehemiah 9, uh, there is the people of Israel basically confessing their sins and, and kind of repenting. Um, and at the end, they, they, they make this plea to God and they say, behold, we are slaves this day, in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its good gifts, behold, we are slaves. And then what does their slavery consist of? They go on. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Okay, so obviously the, the people of Israel are being subjugated, but what does it mean to be subjugated? The fruits, the, the gifts of their land are going to the kings, right? And, and so there's this connection just naturally in their minds, being slaves means 
the fruit of our labor goes to these kings. That's taxation, right? They were being taxed. And it was the fact that they were being taxed that made them slaves. Uh, and, and so this is just another clear example where the, the biblical paradigm is that taxation is slavery. All right. So you go on to say, presumably, one could make the argument that this was only slavery because they were being ruled by foreign kings, and that it would not be slavery if they could rule themselves. However, this argument has a few difficulties. First, the line between neighbors and foreigners is quite arbitrary. Many empires are so large that, all, that almost all their subjects are ruled by people living far away. More importantly, as Christians, we're supposed to view ourselves as being foreigners and exiles of, of all worldly nations. 1 Peter 2.11 We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven and ambassadors for Christ because we have foreign allegiance. Thus, we understand that we always live under alien powers that are opposed to this kingdom of God. When they tax us, we have every reason to identify with the Israelites in Nehemiah. As reminders of the reality that we are living in exile, Peter goes on to talk about what we should look like. Let's look at this passage more in depth. First Peter 2.13. One of the verses that people bring up to justify government and rulership, obviously Romans 13 is one, but First Peter 2 is another one. It starts uh, in verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. All right, hang on one second, because this verse is something I struggle with because we, I can do Romans 13. I can argue Romans 13 all the time, but when, when 1 Peter 2 is brought up, I think you're fixing to break this down for me, but this is something I've struggled with trying to explain First Peter 2 in comparison to Romans 13, but go ahead. Yeah, so the first thing I'll point out, Peter says be subject to every human institution, literally in the Greek, every human creation. So he's immediately saying governments are human creations. They're not God-made, they're man-made, right? Uh, and, and so right away, we should be recognizing that this isn't something that God set up, right? Like like God set up priests and, and God set up a, a whole bunch of things that he wanted to be part of his creation. Government was not something he wanted to be part of his creation. This was a human institution. And yes, God tells us to submit. But again, this, this is just in line with the clear biblical teaching. Uh, this goes back to Romans 13. I like to draw the parallel to Jeremiah 27. So in Jeremiah 27, Jeremiah is, is talking to the Israelites. He's like, okay, so here's the deal. God's going to punish you for your sin. And the way he's going to punish you is he's going to raise up the Babylonians and they're going to come in and they're going to rule over you. And your job is to submit to them. And ever, everyone was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what? Like, aren't, shouldn't we like fight back? Like this is Babylon we're talking about. They're pretty ruthless. And Jeremiah's like, no, this is your punishment from God. Submit to them. And it's interesting. In Jeremiah 27, Babylon is called God's servant. Exact same language Paul uses in Romans 13. And, and there's actually a ton of parallels between Romans 13 and Jeremiah 27. And, and this is exactly what Peter is getting at too. God uses wicked human empires to judge and to discipline his people, to punish wrongdoers, right? Our job is to submit to them out of reverence for Christ. We do that because that's what God commands us to. It doesn't mean that that empire is good. It doesn't mean that they're just. If you read Isaiah 10, God talks about how he raises up Assyria to punish Israel. And then in the very same chapter, he turns around and punishes Assyria for their arrogance and their wickedness in the exact same acts that it says God raised them up to do. So all that to say, just because we're supposed to be subject to this human institution doesn't mean that that, that institution is legitimate or that God approves of it. Let me ask you something real quick, because su submission and, and obedience is different, mm -hmm. especially with Romans 13. And then in Acts 5, Peter says, oh, we, we obey God rather than man. All right. So Obey and, and submit have two different meanings from what I've learned or from what I understand in the Greek. Like there's two different definitions. Am I correct in that or am I, am I misreading it? Because you're obviously more schooled in this than I am. But, I, but I'm curious about this because when I talk to folks about submission to the state and not obeying the state, it's two different things. And it's, it's like, I always, I always bring in Rosa Parks with this. And I think I've talked to you about this, you know, she submitted, but she didn't obey. 
there's two different things going on here. Like it's one thing to submit, but you don't have to obey it. If it's unjust, I mean, we're not we're not obligated to obey an unjust law. Mm-hmm. Now we submit to the the consequences of not obeying these. Am, am I wrong or am I right? Yeah, I guess the way I would conceive of it is that submission is more of like our general attitude, and then obedience has to do with a law by law basis. So there's plenty of examples in both the Old and New Testament where people break the law and are deemed righteous for doing so. Right? Even like like as you mentioned, we must obey God rather than men. So where man's law violates God's law, of course. We, we keep God's law and we break man's law. I think what Paul's really getting at in Romans 13 is like the Christians, the early Christians of that day, they realized that to declare Jesus as Lord means that Caesar is not. They realized that Caesar's rule was illegitimate. And so they were like, okay, well, why don't we just go completely overthrow the government? Like they, they wanted to, to have open rebellion. And the reason Paul had to write Romans 13 was because there were people who wanted to completely overthrow the, the Roman government. And, they, and Paul was like, no, 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 no. Like, we, we got to have a general attitude of submission. Obviously, there's specific cases where we, we have to maintain God's law over man's law. But just because Jesus is Lord doesn't mean we're going to go violently overthrow Caesar because that's not the way of the kingdom. Um, so I would say, and, and, and Peter, uh, in First Peter 2 here, after right after um, saying, be subject to the Lord's sake, he says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover for evil, right? So, so and, and again, that word free, the exact same Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew 17, eleutheros, live as people who are not slaves, okay? So, so we are not going to obey every single whim and every single edict that comes down. We, we obey God first, right? We live as people who are free. However, we're not, we're not going to use that freedom to go sin. We're not going to use that freedom to go violate our neighbor's rights or to, to practice immorality. We're going to use that freedom as much as possible to be righteous uh, because ultimately, God is our is our master, and it's Him that we're obeying. I have a, <laughs> I always I, I I get this from uh, mo- mainly secular anarchists and uppity higher than thou art anarchists when they say you're not really an anarchist if you're paying taxes. And I like what Larkin Rose says, and I'm like uh, he, I'm not paying taxes, I'm avoiding jail. And that's what it is. And, and, and if that's not a definition of, of slavery, I don't know what is. Because if I am paying taxes out of, out of my check that I did not voluntarily give them, but it's taken out of my check. But if I decide to avoid paying taxes, guess what? You're going to jail. I'm avoiding jail time. So, you know, it's, it's compliance in a way that we're not happy with. But we are avoiding jail time so we can do other things to talk about Jesus, so we can advance his kingdom. So I, I, I get tired of that. I get tired of that argument from some anarchists when they're like, well, you're not a real anarchist because you're paying taxes. <laughs> I'm not paying taxes. That shit's been stolen from me. I mean, it's being taken out of my check. I didn't give it to them. They took it from me. And if I didn't allow that to happen, I guess I am allowing it to happen. Otherwise, I'd be in jail. So I don't. I, I, get, I get tired of that snooty argument from from anarchists about about taxes because I'm not. Yeah, no, me, me too. Paul says in Romans twelve eighteen, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Here's the thing: in Paul's perspective, getting the gospel out there was number one priority, right? And so he's like, look, if living peacefully, if paying your taxes is going to win some hearts and minds is, is going to make people view you as, as more righteous. And then maybe that can open up an opportunity to share the gospel with them and do it. Right. Just like he says elsewhere in first Corinthians, like um, to the Jew, I became like a Jew to the Gentile. I became like a Gentile that I, that by whatever means I might win some, right. Paul is saying, look, as a strategy for getting the gospel out there, going and like openly revolting just isn't the way of the kingdom. It's, it's not actually going to help. We want people to look at us as upstanding people. And if we're just going around causing trouble, even if it's justified, that's ultimately not going to get us to our end goal, right? And so this is why Peter, when he goes on to talk about slaves, he's like, continue to be subject to your masters so that you might win them, right? And and you can suffer unjustly, but that's a lot better than just going and revolting. And then everyone just looks down on you, even though you might have been justified in doing it. Let me ask you something. How do you feel about civil disobedience? I think it's great. I, I think we should practice it in certain contexts. Um, I, I don't think we should just do it for the sake of doing it like all the time because I can. Uh, but I think there's many contexts where it is a great tool to demonstrate the state's illegitimacy. So 
during the, the this past at the time of this recording the past 19 20 months do you think that we have every reason or every right as christians to be civilly disobedient to the state i'm not a, a, an advocate for violence i'm not an advocate for a revolution you know i'm not that's not my thing i mean mm -hmm. i think that we can do more by promoting the kingdom of christ than by, by promoting a, a violent revolution because i heard somebody say this one time it's like even if you won the revolution, if you went arm in arm with the, with the government, even if you won, there's still going to be somebody standing there with a sword in their hand. That's not the way of Christ. I, I think I love how Martin Luther King and they handled this during these civil rights protests. They did it peacefully and they were jailed. They were beaten and he was adamant. We will not fight back now. Some of them did, and I get it. I understand the frustration. I mean, man, if you're if you're gonna come and, and, and hose me, sick your dog on me, I'm probably gonna fight back. And I know that we're not supposed to violently fight back, but I believe that civil disobedience is the way of Christians. That's how Christians should be behaving. Now, we're gonna submit, but we're not gonna be happy about it and we're not going to obey this garbage that you're trying to force on us but we're going to do it civilly and they were like well that's that's just a coward way out no it's not actually i think it might take i think it takes more courage as a person to handle how the state is treating us civilly because you might go to jail you might get beaten but who's watching who's watching this happen you know, we're all students of history as anarchists. We, we're anarchists for a reason because we're students of history. We see, we've seen how the state behaves. God told us in 1 Samuel 8 how the state's going to behave. We're students of history. Now, how do you respond? Do you respond violently? That's what they want. They want you to respond violently. Uh -uh. That's not how you win hearts to Jesus. That's not how you teach about Jesus. That's not how you promote the, the kingdom of Christ. You promote it by peace. And he was a peacemaker. He was not a war maker. And I think that's how, and we can go on a tangent or something, but I, that's I, that's how we do this. We promote the kingdom of Christ peacefully. It may not happen in our lifetime, but somebody's watching. We're going to be viewed in the future as history, right? They're not going to see us out there, you know, burning down buildings. We're going to see us, you know, loving our neighbor, loving our enemy. Yeah, my, my threshold for civil disobedience is, comes back to Acts 5.29. Uh, we must obey God rather than man. Um, God's first two commandments are love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. Okay, if the state passes a law that gets in the way of me loving my neighbor, I will disobey that law so that I can love my neighbor. If I don't have to break any of God's laws to keep the state's law, then I'll, I'll defer to keeping the state's laws. But loving your neighbor is pretty broad, right? There are a lot of things that the state tries to stop you to do that constitute loving your neighbor. Uh, and so I think in all of those instances, uh, loving your neighbor takes precedence, and, and that's when we should practice civil disobedience. I agree. And I think that's a, a good point to end on, man. I I really appreciate you coming on. And, and this article was not something you wrote for thebadroman.com. It was something that you wrote yourself and were graceful enough to uh, have us publish it on our website and we really appreciate it, man. It got some great feedback and I don't know if we covered everything on it. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a long article, not super long. It's a, it's a very interesting read and it's a very on point read because let me ask you this, Patrick, is taxation theft or is it slavery? Yes, it's both. <laughs> it's theft, it's slavery, it's extortion, um, whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think focusing on the slavery piece is uh, a lot more in line with the biblical paradigm. And a lot more, it really reveals the injustice. Yeah, I love it because, like I said, it's something that I've been trying to get folks to understand that we are living under a, a, a system that makes us slaves. And when you say taxation is theft, that seems very milk toast to me now. Mm -hmm. But when you say taxation is slavery, all right, now let's now let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. Let's talk about this because taxation is slavery. My dad called me before we got on here and he's a, he's a church of Christ preacher. I was like, well, I got a few minutes. I I'm fixing to do a podcast. And 
He goes, what's the podcast about today? I was like, I'm going to talk to a guy that wrote an article about taxation as slavery from a biblical case. He goes, oh. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's something that maybe preachers need to start talking about, you know, because we don't, we, we just, we just go along to get along because, oh, well, the government said this, it's a, uh, it's okay. We're just going along, you know, but it is slavery. We need to, we need, I think if people recognize this as slavery, then they would start fighting back. You know, how, how folks fought against slavery and segregation, and all that stuff. If we started understanding this is slavery, if we started understanding the systems of humans, human governments as slavery, people might actually start fighting back. If they could just get that in their head, it's a hard pill to swallow because we've been we've been living this life. You're a lot. You're about what twenty years younger than me, and so, and I told you this in our first episode. I'm hoping folks your age start waking up to this because y'all are our future. Y'all are the ones that are going to be pushing this because long after I'm gone, Patrick Carroll's going to be talking some trash about taxation and slavery, and I need I need folks to start doing this. We need we need folks to start talking about this. Yeah, there's, there's one last verse I want to end on, uh, which I, I get to in, in the article, and it's Matthew 20. Um, so the, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him something. She says, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right and one at your left, in your kingdom, right? So like positions of authority. And uh, the, the disciples kind of get indignant at that. And Jesus said, listen, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. To, to me, that is one of the clearest places in the entire scripture where Jesus says, look, the kings of the world, they exercise authority. That is not the way of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is an upside down kingdom. The first will be last. The way to be noble in the kingdom of heaven is not to be served, is not to coercively exact tribute from your neighbor but to serve them, to give to them. That is the teaching of Jesus. And to me, it, it just completely excludes the idea of using government to rule over your neighbors. Yes, I love that. Yes, <laughs> more of that, please. It, you're right, it, it is an upside down kingdom. And the things we're talking about is very upside down to a lot of folks. And somebody asked me, they had he had me on a show and he, he asked me about the Bad Roman Project. He goes, what is... And he's not a Christian, but he was, but he's an anarchist. And he was asking, you know, what are y'all doing? What are you, why are y'all getting so much traction? I said, cause we're talking about things that people aren't talking about. We're turning people's worldview upside down. And that's exactly what Christians should be doing. We should be turning the worldview upside down and showing them a different way. And it, and it resonates with folks. Some people, you know, the majority of folks scoff and that's fine. You can laugh at me all you want. I'm still going to sleep well at night because <laughs> I know in the end who my king is and who I'm going to follow. Patrick, go ahead and plug whatever you want to plug. And I'll let you get out of here. Yeah, I, I work for the Foundation for Economic Education, so you can uh, find me there. Uh, you can also find my Facebook page, The Prudent Navigator, uh, my blog, which is theprudentnavigator.wordpress.com, and you can find me on Twitter at PatrickC1995. Awesome, man. Uh, I love talking to you, man. You, you, you have a, like I said in the beginning, you have a way of getting people to think. And I, and I love that about you. And I, and I'm very proud of, of, of your work and I, and I hope you just, just keep on keeping those people are rooting you on, man. I know you, you're struggling there in Canada. We're struggling here in the United States, but keep on keeping on because we are rooting you on buddy. I'm uh, getting people to think is exactly what I want to do. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, sir. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about the Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.